I really am honored to be here. I'm so uh, indebted to Pastor John and Debbie and just the whole family, the whole tribe here. You guys have done so amazing to host uh, a move of God, and it's only going to increase. Um, it, it really is. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I wasn't waiting for a response. Just, I, I sometimes just stop. Um, it really is. I, I feel like the next, the next thing that's going to start happening with increase has probably already happened. But the next thing that will start happening with increase is people will start being healed in the preaching of the word. Uh, and, and in worship, there'll be uh, unusual things. W whenever he shows up, things just happen. And uh, it's important that we adjust our expectation and our perception of, of what God uh, not only can do, but is doing. The devil believes what he can do. So we got to improve our faith from the devil's faith. <laughs> that was kind of a joke, but it's all right. It's, uh, it, it, was, it was touch and go there for a moment, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's really a treat to be here because you've done so well. It's not hard to get God to show up. He was born in a manger. He's not that picky. Um, but, but, to, but to get him to stay is a different matter altogether. And you're, you're hosting something that is very, very significant. And as long as we don't steady the ark, you know, we'll be fine. And uh, I, I love the fact that uh, there's such a childlike faith here. Uh, it's so encouraging to me, so encouraging. Um, It is. There's such hope wherever there's childlike faith. Uh, I, I only get into trouble when I know, when I think I know what I'm doing. I, I do a lot better when I'm the child that's absolutely dependent on the Father. And so, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for you guys, and, and I'm glad I get to be here. I, am, I have something very important to read to you, as I usually do. A man and his wife and his mother-in-law went on vacation to the Holy Land. While they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for $5,000, or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150. The man thought about it and told him he'd just soon have her shipped home. The undertaker asked, why? Why would you have her shipped home and spend $5,000? when it would be wonderful to have her buried here, only spend $150. The man replied, a man died here 2,000 years ago. He was buried here. Three days later, he rose from the dead. <laughs> and I just can't take that chance. <laughs> uh, I do think that's funny. So. <laughs> I, one of the things that I emphasize a lot is our responsibility. He's sovereign. He is sovereign. But the, the Bible says God lights the fire on the altar. It's the priests that keep it burning. His heart has always been for co-laboring. It's always been for partnership. He can do everything we do better. That's not his dream. That's not his desire. And God does have dreams. His desire is to co-labor with his people, those made in his image who worship by choice, to co-labor with them, to see his purposes done on the earth. That's his heart. Because of the emphasis that I make on our responsibility, it's often stated, well, we can do nothing without him. And that's true, but our problem is, is we've learned to do nothing with him. When the presence of God is in your life, resurrection power is expected. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in every believer, and he wants out. He's in us as a river, not a lake. He longs to flow through us to alter, can I say, the geography, the circumstances that exist around us. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, Jesus went about doing good, 
healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus is eternally God. We know that. He never stopped being God. But he chose to live with a dependency on the Holy Spirit that would become a model that we could follow. His own autobiography, his own self-description was, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself. And I've looked in the original language, and the word nothing actually means nothing. <laughs> he actually said what he meant, and he meant what he said. It's not that he couldn't have performed anything glorious and majestic and powerful as God, but he chose to live with limitations because he wanted to give an example that could be followed. He concluded, in many ways, his life and ministry in John 20 with this statement, as the Father has sent me, I send you. My assignment is now your assignment. The redemptive assignment to see things happen in the earth that illustrate the heart of a perfect and loving Father. And that's your privilege, that's my privilege in life. I wanna to talk to you out of a story um, that Jesus presented, or that's presented to us in Mark chapter eight. So if you would open you, your Bibles to Mark eight, we're going to read a portion of scripture that in some ways has been, in some ways has been the most important story in the gospels for me, in the way that the Lord has taught me about faith, has taught me about his heart. And uh, so we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Just open to it, hold it open, and I'll get there in a minute or two, or, or five. <laughs> we will get there. Faith is not a mental exercise. It's not something that you actually get to choose. It's not the product of will. It's the product of surrender. It's not the result of striving. Faith, faith either shows up as a gift, something God gives us in the moment for a specific situation, or it's a fruit that is developed with use. It grows through use. Faith doesn't come from the mind. It comes from the heart. With the heart, man believes under righteousness. I can't choose faith. It's actually my design as a believer. Believer, be believer. One of the great mysteries in life is there are unbelieving believers and believing unbelievers. Faith comes as a product of surrender to what is my nature in Christ. It's actually the work of the Holy Spirit to, to believe God. Faith is the only reasonable response to one who is so perfectly faithful. It's interesting that we see the enemy's thinking, his strategy, his, his, uh, the way he attempts to work in our life, but how he first tempted Adam and Eve and then how he first tempted the last Adam, who is Jesus. When he came to Adam and Eve, he said, has God said, when he came to Jesus in the wilderness, he said, if you're the son of God. To question what God said and to question identity are the two major points of all temptation, which tells me then that the solution to establish myself in great faith is to discover what God has said and to discover who he made me to be. When you find out who God made you to be, you never want to be anyone else. You're perfectly equipped for his design. You can't have design without a designer. We're not here randomly. We're here by selection, by choice. And we see throughout scripture that he has a purpose, a design that is beyond what any of us would have the intelligence to ask for. Any of us would have the faith to pray for. 
He said that he's going to work abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. Ask is our prayer life, think is our imagination. He longs to work beyond anything we could come up with. And I can come up with some pretty good things. And he has, he has told me through the word, through the scripture, that his design is to work beyond the reach of my greatest imagination, beyond the reach of my greatest prayer. There are all kinds of warnings from people about excess. You know, revival never ended because of excess. They only end because of control. And there are many warnings of excess. Am I concerned about excess? I am. But he doesn't seem to be as concerned. He's not as offendable as I am. That was such a good point, Bill. That was so good. That was just so good. That's too late. It's too late. You, you, you missed your chance. <laughs> what he purposes to do on the earth is extreme. It's extravagant. And while there are all kinds of warnings of possible excess, I pay no attention to the warnings of excess from those who are satisfied with lack. <laughs> so, faith does not come from the mind, it comes from the heart. And one of the things, one of the main things I wanna to do Today, I, I think tonight, we'll see how things go and perhaps even tomorrow, is I want to talk to you a lot about the renewed mind. And, I, and let me tell you why. The renewed mind, I believe, is key, number one, to personal transformation and ultimately to societal transformation. It starts with the renewing of the mind. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The transformation of a person is only in the measure his mind or her mind is, is renewed. There is no transformation of a person beyond how their mind is renewed. Don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. I've heard people say um, that there are three dimensions to the will of God. There's the, good accept there's the good will of God, the acceptable will of God, and the perfect will of God. I've heard people say, I, I don't want to do the perfect will of God, I just want to do the acceptable. If you think like that, slap yourself. <laughs> That's just stupid. Those are three words that all describe the exact same thing. It's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. So what does a renewed mind do? It proves the will of God. It is able to display and approve of that which God says, these are my purposes in the earth. The best definition, I think, in the Bible for the will of God is in the disciples' prayer, where he said, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's so my personal conviction that that commission to pray in that way is the backbone of all commissions. Even the commission to go into all the world is subservient to this because this is the overriding revelation of God's heart for humanity, is that His will would be done here as it is there. Matthew 12, 28 says, if I cast a demon, Jesus is talking, if I cast a demon out of you by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God came upon you. So what he's saying, he's saying, listen, if I cast a devil out of a person, what's happening that you can't see is that there's an unseen world called the kingdom of God that is colliding with the darkness that is residing in that person. That's actually what all ministry is. Everybody in this room that is a born again believer, you actually you cause the collision of two worlds. That's called ministry, that's called life. 
we bring about the collision of two worlds, that which is superior to that which is inferior. Light will always win over darkness. When the light is turned on, there's no debate. You don't hear darkness yell, I'm not leaving. <laughs> it automatically leaves because light is that superior. The kingdom of God in Romans uh, 10, 17 says the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. In other words, it's not tangible in the physical world. But it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, righteousness, peace, and joy, two of those three things are felt realities. And yet we have so many warn us against experience. People will say, well, if you are pursuing an experience with God, you're open to deception. If you're not, you're already deceived. <laughs> He's not a philosophy. He's not a marriage license that you put on the wall. He's a relational God that is to be encountered. The scripture defines who we are and what we do. But most of the time when I hear people say, well, that's not in the Bible, it's just in, not in the part of the Bible that they believe in. <laughs> that, that felt so good to say. I just, I, I, I'm here edifying myself today. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> so here, the renewed mind is able to prove the will of God, which is what? On earth as it is in heaven. See, while faith doesn't come from the mind, it comes from the heart. The renewed mind is like the banks of a river, the context for faith to flow in. You will find throughout Scripture the renewed mind and faith working in tandem constantly. Your mind is a great student, a horrible master. All right, well, that went over well. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's get hurry and go to uh, Mark chapter 8. All right, Mark chapter 8. You guys there? You guys have Bibles? Do you actually believe? Yeah, you like Bibles. I love my, you guys. I got my, I've got a team here from Reading with me. I'm so glad. Wave your hand so everybody can see you. These people are wonderful. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at this. And uh, the Lord has used this portion of Scripture uh, more than any other on the subject of the renewed mind. So let me talk to you about this. We'll start with verse 13. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. They did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves saying, it's because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, Twelve. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. And he said to them, how is it you do not understand? This is a fascinating story to me for a whole bunch of reasons, but the primary reason is that Jesus expected the disciples to think different because of the miracles they had experienced under his leadership. He had led them into encounters where they saw food multiply. We've had things multiply, we've seen it. Where God miraculously causes food to multiply, where he causes money to multiply, where he causes many things to just bring un, uh, supernaturally increase. He hasn't changed. And the disciples had been in these encounters, these experiences where they saw food multiply, and yet when Jesus said, be careful of the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees, they got nervous that they didn't bring enough food for lunch. Do you see the problem? He has multiplied food twice 
and they're nervous about not having food for lunch. <laughs> How many of you have ever had supernatural provision of the Lord? I mean, you've, you've had the Lord provide for you financially. How many of you had another financial crisis after that? How many of you were as nervous the second time as you were the first time? Yeah. <laughs> That's what he's addressing right there. The miracle is supposed to change perception. See, the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste is experience, see is perception. What you experience will alter your perception. Yes. There's not clarity of sight until there's, in this relational journey, there's actually a relationship until there's experience. So in Romans, he said, um, he said, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. Elsewhere, Paul said, what you can see is temporal, what you can't see is eternal. In other words, what you can't see is actually superior. It's the reason that faith lives from the unseen towards the visible. It's anchored in invisible realities. It's not anchored in what we can reason, taste, touch, smell. But genuine faith affects the tangible physical world. So when he says the kingdom of God isn't meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, he's describing the reality of the kingdom is in the presence of God. The Holy Spirit actually contains the reality called kingdom of God. Kingdom is the king's domain, it's the reality of his dominion is in this, this manifested presence of the Spirit of God. When Jesus said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it was actually a command to change the way they think. Now, it's not, um, it's, it's not mental gymnastics. It's such a, a deep remorse, heartfelt remorse over sin that it, it sponsors a change in perception. It's critical that we learn what this means. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's within reach, it's in the here, it's in the now. Change the way you think. It's as though Jesus said, I brought my world with me, and if you don't change your perspective in, on reality, you can live your entire lifetime within arm's reach of everything you ache for, but you'll never get it. So every time Jesus spoke, the presence of God was actually released. It's the reason crowds would say, we've never heard anyone talk like this before. They'd heard lots of talk their whole life, but they had not heard that talk. Because in his talk, words became presence. He describes this for us in John chapter six. He says, my words to you are spirit and they are life. In other words, my words become presence and that presence gives life. Which is interesting because in John one, it says Jesus is the word made flesh, but now when he talks, the word is made spirit. Are you guys alive? Like, <laughs> you still breathing and everything? Yeah, all right. So he says, words become spirit. Why is that important? Because the kingdom of God is in the reality of the spirit. That's why he could say, repent, because it's within reach. When I spoke to you, Jesus, now, when he spoke to us, the reality of God's rule, his dominion, is present and within reach. That's why clothing could release power. That's why he could say to the centurion, go your way, your servant lives. You never see Jesus praying for anyone to be healed. It's not that it's illegal. The Bible says the prayer of faith heals the sick. You just don't see him doing it because he knew who he was and he knew the Father's heart. So instead of requesting what he already knew to be God's will, he released it through decree. That's worth the entire day if we can catch that right there. The two temptations we face in life, everything falls under these two categories. Of the first one to Adam, has God said, to question God's word. And the last Adam, Jesus, if you're the son of God. To get these things anchored and settled in our heart actually makes what the enemy would use as a temptation so unattractive it has no place to land. 
finding out what God has said, finding out who he says we are. And you can't discover who you are until you discover who he is. So we've got this story. I love this story more than I can tell you. Because here, Jesus, they, they multiplied food twice. By the way, when they multiplied uh, the loaves, they had, what, five loaves for 5,000 men, not counting women and children, so probably more like 15 to 20,000 people. But we'll just take five. Five loaves for 5,000. How many baskets did they have left? Twelve. When they fed a smaller group, 4,000, they started with seven loaves and had seven baskets left. In other words, they fed more when they had less. They actually fed more when they had less. You, you have to understand this, that we, 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 often, we often think more is better, and it's not always true. Sometimes less is best. It, it's not that amounts are in and of themselves evil or virtuous. It's how much of it is being given to him. I heard a statement uh, from uh, Dr. Jack Hayford this last week um, on a video. He's, he went home to be with Jesus, so he didn't show up and talk to me, just so, <laughs> just so that rumors don't get started. I've got enough, I got enough out there, I don't need any more. <laughs> just to clarify. <laughs> he made this statement. He said, Mary, the mother of Jesus, this young lady is visited by an angel. The angel says, you're gonna give birth to the Christ child. And she says, how can this be? I'm still a virgin. She thought the fact she was a virgin disqualified her. And what Jack pointed out was that what she thought disqualified her is actually what qualified her. And there's a lot of folks in this room here, as there is at, uh, at home for me, for Bethel and Reading. There's a lot of folks that feel disqualified. And the very thing you feel disqualified about is actually what qualifies you. Because once he touches that area of disqualification, everything that goes forth shouts grace, shouts the mercy of God, shouts the love of a perfect father. And I love these stories where we see Jesus impacting more people with more left. I love the fact that God has leftovers. I like leftovers. I like food. I like food. I like to get full and then have more left. I, that's, that to me is like, throw in a nap and that's heaven right there. That's the, yeah. So here Jesus reveals the nature of his world, but he talks first to his disciples and he says, he says, be careful of the leaven of Herod, that's the political system. And the leaven of the Pharisees, that's the religious system. There's a third leaven in Matthew 13, it's called the leaven of the kingdom of God. So in reality, there's three leavens, or can I put it this way? Three influences on the way you think and see. Everything that fights for your attention and mine falls into one of those three categories. The leaven of Herod. It's a political system, it's humanism in, in its nature. It doesn't mind a belief in God, just don't bring him into everyday affairs. The religious system has God at the center of everything, but he's impersonal and powerless. It's the form, external form of things, but not the reality. And then there's the kingdom. And Jesus warns about these two influences on the mind, on perception. And the disciples think he's talking about lunch. <laughs> he's bringing this profound revelation that's going to shape the rest of their life. And they think he noticed they forgot to bring bread. <laughs> and that's where it's like he says, all right, let's just pretend we're talking about bread. And he takes them through the multiplying of the food. But I love this story because he's, he's presenting them with the fact, uh, no, I, I don't think he does this at all in a, in a criti critical or shaming way. 
whenever he points out stuff, it's always with invitation for transformation. It's, it's never to leave us in our, in our mess. So he, he confronts the disciples on this. And he says, why do you reason that you have no bread? You know, let's pretend we're talking about lunch. Why, why did you start thinking there when you've seen our history together? When there's been the multiplication of food? Let me put it differently. This that you experienced in the miraculous was supposed to train you how to think and to see differently so that you would see the absence of bread in a boat as the opportunity for the kingdom to be displayed. You think different if you're trained by the miraculous. And I'm, I'm telling you, I, I say this uh, as, as soberly as I know how, miracles are expensive. Not to get them, but what they require. Because here, here are the disciples that saw the multiplying of food and they're still thinking the way they would have before the multiplying of food. You, you can't stay the same. Once, once I get exposed to certain things, I'm expected to change. Now, Jesus never required this of his disciples before the multiplying of food. But in this moment, he's requiring a shift in perspective. The renewed mind is an evidence of experience in God. It starts with Scripture, no question. But Scripture without experience falls short. Many people stop short of a divine encounter because they're satisfied with good theology. Jesus said in, in John chapter 5, he said, he says, you search the scriptures because you think in them is eternal life, but these testify of me and you're not willing to come to me. So in other words, this is the launching pad to divine encounter. Revelation that does not lead to a personal encounter with Jesus only makes us more capable of arguing with those who disagree. But there's no transformational part in that encounter. So Jesus talks to them about this. He says, why do you reason that you have no bread? Once you've experienced supernatural provision, you've lost the right to start any thought process with what you don't have. You've lost the right. I got the same response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, that was a joke, that was a joke. I, I, I really am a nice guy, I promise, I promise. Once you, your, your experience in, in God are to be taken seriously, because in every encounter, every experience are the seeds for transformational thinking. How many of you know we can sit here and see testimonies and rejoice and get happy but not think the same, I mean, not change our thinking? In other words, I can hear, I can hear you know, somebody give a testimony of, of great provision and celebrate their great provision but walk out as afraid over my own finances as when I came in the building. So the, the miracles that we see, that we participate in, are actually tutors. They are actually disciples, mentors, to come in and to teach me how to think. That's why they have to be taken to heart. What does this mean? That someone could stand here and point and declare something and have a miracle take place. It's not the greatness of the individual, it's the source of the word. Jesus said, go your way, your servant lives. How is that even possible? It's not mental gymnastics. It's not, you know, the greatness of any individual. It's the power of the word that Jesus declared. Now, I, I get it. Jesus is eternally God. And, and I, I believe that with absolutely all of my heart. But think about this with me for a moment. What's more powerful? He only says what his father says, right? The, the answer is yes. Yeah, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll help you cheat on your test here. He only says, we, here's his father say yes. You know, I gave you the answer and you still were slow. That's like, all right. So he only, I'm not going to pause this time. He only, he only says what he hears his father say. So, well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I knew we would do this. That was good. So what's more powerful, the word of the father through Jesus' lips or the word of the father through yours? The power is not through the, because of the vessel, it's from the source. Amen. 
if you, if you understand that, then you understand how Jesus could declare greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. So he says, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? That's, that's the one that messes with me. Is your heart still hardened? Yeah, apparently it is. Sometimes I don't feel like it is at all, but I can't see and I can't hear. And he asked the question, is your heart still hard? Is it possible that you've seen the work of the Lord so much you've become jaded? Here's what happens to many people. I personally, I think resentment and disappointment are the two main killers in the body of Christ. They rob, rob the church of hope, those two things, disappointment and resentment. It's so possible to see this person healed and celebrate it, but then carry the baggage of what didn't happen. And God becomes defined in our life by what didn't happen instead of what did. I refuse to build a theology around what I didn't experience. I will only build a theology around what he said, what he promised, and what he has done. I can't afford to do the other. I'm very, very serious about that. So he asks a series of questions here in verse 18. He says, having eyes do you not see? And I'll be honest with you, uh, I see much less than I hear. I hear better than I see. By seeing, I don't mean seeing angels fly through the room. I, I mean that there, there is a perception that you have with your eyes that you can have where you see the work, the move of God, move of the Holy Spirit. And I love it so much. Sometimes you're, you're looking at something and everything appears to be natural, but you know that you know something. And you couldn't explain why if your life depended on it, but you still know. And it's, there's a perception that takes place. I'll never forget um, a situation years ago where a lady came up to me. She had, she had a, a medical pump on her hip. She uh, had medication pumping directly into her heart. It kept her alive. When she changed the bag of medication, she had, I forget, four minutes, seven minutes, something like that to change it or she would die. And uh, she came up and she said, I believe that tonight's my night, and, uh, which I've heard probably a thousand times, and I like it every time I hear it, but this time was different. I actually... I could feel physically faith walk up to me. I can't describe it, I don't know something. She walked up, she said, tonight's my night. And this is exactly what I did. I was so overwhelmed by the measure of faith on her, I stepped back. <laughs> I, I, it, she probably felt funny, but I stared at her head to toe. I honestly, and I, from her toe back to her head, I wanted every cell in my body to be awake at, at what faith looked like. I don't know if this makes sense to him, but I wanted my entire being to see the substance of another world called faith. Prayed for her, she was dramatically healed. She came back the next night and you know, was able to remove the medication and, and was healed, but it was an extraordinary miracle. So he says, he, he asked the questions, he asked a series of questions, and these questions helped me to understand the working of faith. He says, can you see, can you hear, can you remember? Okay, oftentimes, when I have that question posed to me from the Lord in Scripture, I have to answer, no, I can't see. I, I really don't know what you're doing. I can't perceive it. So he goes to the next level. He says, can you hear? I do hear better than I see, but there are times I'm not hearing either. And he goes to the next one. He says, can you remember? And I realize I can always remember. I'll always remember what I value. Here's the amazing thing is that when you bring to mind, and I love the stewardship of your leadership of bringing stories that you guys experience, what happens in this house, bringing them before you constantly. Because if I can, if I can, See, we, we attribute seeing and hearing to spiritual giftings, graces, but remembering you can do intentionally. That's right. That's right. You can't intentionally see, but you can intentionally remember. And what happens is when I remember, my hearing improves. Yeah. That's good. 
And when my hearing improves, my seeing improves. Jesus, this is all relational journey. He's taking all of us on this relational journey where we learn his heart. We learn how he thinks. We begin to pick up his mood. We begin to pick up times where we have to go fast. We pick up the times where I must slow down. I must become the child that waits. Is the, the great, not conflict, the great paradox in Scripture is that the violent take it by force in Matthew 11 and in Mark 10, unless you receive it as a child, you can by no means enter. So you've got these two sides of the same coin. Sometimes it requires to get up and to go and to grab hold of something. And other times you have to just sit down and be quiet. Sometimes it's all about you learning your authority and you apprehend. And other times you just learned your identity that you're a son, a daughter, and you receive by inheritance. And his lessons for us shift and change not just with seasons, sometimes in the day. But the point is, we're all on this relational journey because he's teaching us how to think because the renewed mind displays the will of God. The renewed mind will put on display the will of God. There's something about, you remember the unbelief that was in Nazareth? We might look at that this week, but the unbelief in Nazareth where Jesus could do no mighty works but lay his hands on a few sick people. What happened? Unbelief destroyed the corporate anointing. The corporate anointing is where things just randomly begin to happen, which you guys have experienced, but you're about to experience more. The corporate anointing. And the reason, the reason isn't because of any special gifting in any of us. It's because of the yes. It's the heart of God to a people that said yes. And in that corporate anointing, sometimes you just call out a sickness. Sometimes you just call out an area and things just begin to happen. Sometimes you don't say anything and miracles start happening because of a corporate anointing. Well, in Nazareth, that corporate anointing shut down because of unbelief. But it says Jesus laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Nothing can shut down what you carry personally. The laying in of hands to impart what you have was necessary for Jesus to bring about healing. I'm going to pray for you. Why don't you stand? I feel like I just landed that plane in the side of a hill. <laughs> Hopefully you're still okay. I don't know. We'll, we'll check to see. <laughs> I want to pray the most important thing I could think of to pray for you. The Lord is about to reveal his glory and, and we will be undone. We will be undone. There's no explanation. And I want to pray for that. Father, I ask in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for this leadership team, for Pastor John and Debbie and staff. Thank you for James River, multiple campuses. I give you honor for all of it. But I'm asking, increase what you've done here and manifest your glory over this people, over this place, over these campuses. Let there be the manifested presence of King Jesus in a way that just undoes us. This is a word from the Lord out of Isaiah 60. Kings will come to your light and nations to the brightness of your rising. And the context is the glory of the Lord being seen upon his people. God, we pray that right now that kings would come to the light of the glory of God upon this house and nations to the brightness of their rising. I pray this for the honor of the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.